All right, great. I think I think we've given enough time, and I'll I'll go ahead and get us get us kicked off. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Thomas Dobbs. I'm the state health officer with the Mississippi State Department of Health. Um, today, we'll be talking about maternal and infant health and uh, a real sober assessment of where we are as a state and what our opportunities are for the future to improve on our, our current status. And if we can go ahead and have the next slide, please. So here's gonna be our agenda. I will give a brief introduction and then we're very excited to have Bailey Anderson, Miss Mississippi USA, who is a nurse who works with newborns and um, in, in a hospital and also with um, the, the delivering mothers and has a really good and unique perspective about how important it is that we support maternal and infant health. Then we'll have uh, Lauren Casehagen and Monica Stinson discussing um, maternal and infant health status and strategies for prevention. We have um, Monica Stinson talking about community requests for proposals. We have an RP out there that we want everyone to be aware of. And then uh, Jillian Harper PV will talk about uh, the Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies of Mississippi program, and we'll have a wrap up and some questions. But just to kick it off, I want to make everybody understand really what a challenge we face in the state of Mississippi. We know that we face some of the biggest barriers, and we also know those reasons. We have the most severe challenges in the setting of uh, social determinants of health, right? We know what drives health at the foundational level. It's poverty, it's unemployment, it's uh, systemic and institutionalized racism. All of these factors are compounded and combined to make it very difficult for simple measures to overcome some of the challenges that we're seeing. Um, as you'll see, Mississippi does have some significant challenges in infant and maternal health, including infant mortality and maternal mortality and morbidity in, within these different things. We do lead the nation, but we know there are evidence-based ways that we can reduce these things. We have targets where we can make improvement. And as the State Department of Health, we strive to be evidence-based in all of our activities, and we are moving to make sure that whatever interventions we can introduce, we aggressively do so in a manner such that we can have an impact on the health status of, of Mississippi moms and babies. So with that, I'll go ahead and ask if our Miss Mississippi USA, Bailey Anderson, is here and ready to give, um, uh, give her, her segment of the uh, talk. Uh, Bailey, are you here? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Hey, Bailey, welcome. Hi. Okay, so um, just to get started, he already said it, but um, I'm Bailey Anderson, and I was crowned this past March as Miss Mississippi USA. I also just completed nursing school actually last year, so I am a fairly new nurse, um, but I graduated in the middle of the pandemic, which was amazing. That was such a great thing, <laughs> um, and I started working uh, this past year um, as a newborn nurse. So I am a newborn nurse actually at Providence Hospital in Mobile, Alabama. But of course, as Miss Mississippi USA, I'm super passionate about our state. So I wanted, um, you know, when I was crowned, I started thinking, you know, what can I do this year to make a difference? What, what am I passionate about? You know, because I think a lot of people sometimes get really confused about this, this thing that I end up getting on my head and they think that it's about them. But I think at the end of the day, it's about what I can do. For other people and as a newborn nurse this obviously is an area that I'm super passionate about um so I reached out to Dr. Dobbs and I shot him an email and I was like what can we do in the state of Mississippi and we had a meeting we met um and he started talking about doing this kind of town hall where we talked about this specific topic in the matter of you know women's health um and I think that one of the biggest things you know he's talking about infant mortality and how high that it is but a lot of that I think ties into prenatal care I know that for me, at my position as a newborn nurse, I've seen so many babies that come in or technically moms that come in and they've not had prenatal care or they've had very little prenatal care. And first off, that's a little scary for a newborn nurse. When I go into a delivery and I don't really know what's going to happen, don't really know what I'm getting into as far as the baby, I think that can be a little bit scary. But I also think, you know, that it's not just scary for me. I think it's scary in the sake of the baby. I think that we don't always know what may happen. Um, I know a good example of this in my case is I've seen lots of babies that come in that because they had no, no prenatal care or we don't have a history and physical on a mom, we are not aware that the mom took drugs during the pregnancy. I think that's probably one of the biggest sectors that we see a problem with when it comes to prenatal care. And that can obviously be very difficult because when a baby starts going into withdrawal and you weren't aware that a mother was on drugs, 
you kind of have to jump into action super fast there um, because although the withdrawal symptoms obviously is kind of a slower process and develops over a few days, it's something that if you're not aware of that, you know, could potentially end up a really bad situation. And so I think that that's something that, you know, Dr. Dobbs, we really wanted to try to focus on was, you know, the importance of prenatal care. And I don't want to say it wrong, so I'm going to look at my but um, the exact program was the perinatal high risk management infant services system that I kind of talked to him about. That's a part of Mississippi and what um, we're trying to advance really is that program. And so I think, you know, the biggest part of this Zoom and all that we're here talking about and doing is that at the end of the day, when it does come to moms and babies, especially the babies, you know, they're they're the voiceless. They don't they don't have a voice to speak for themselves. So in this opportunity, you know, we're able to be their voice. We're able to be the ones that take up for them, you know, in their time of need, if their mothers didn't have prenatal care or really in any, any other situations of a high risk, high risk pregnancy. And so I think that, you know, what we're doing today is a super great opportunity for us to be their voice, for us to advocate for the newborn babies and to make sure, you know, that they get the care that they need and so do their moms. And so I'm excited to see what everyone else has to talk about today and to see, you know, how we can make a difference in Mississippi, because, you know, I think if anyone can make a difference in the matter of healthcare, it's people that work within it. So, you know, let's, let's see what we can do across our state. And I'm excited to see what everyone else has to say today. Hey, thank you so much, Bailey. And thank you for joining, joining us in this mission. Um, it, it, it is critical for the health of our kids, also for the vibrancy of our future. So again, again, thank you. We look forward to continuing to, to work with you and use your expertise. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to uh, Lauren Casehagen, who will start off the conversation about uh, maternal and infant health status in Mississippi. Lauren, why don't you go ahead and take over? Thanks, Dr. Dobbs. Next slide. In 2019, over 36,000 women, Mississippi women had a live birth and about 95% of those women delivered in a Mississippi hospital. Maternal race and ethnicity is changing over time and becoming more diverse, but the majority of births occur to women who are white non-Hispanic and black non-Hispanic. Almost all of the births to Mississippi residents are to women between the ages of 15 and 44 years. And over half of the women had a live birth, who had a live birth, were not married at the time of that birth. Next slide. In 2019, more than half of the women who had a live birth had more than a high school education. And about two out of three births were covered by Medicaid. Next slide. Even though pregnancy and birth outcomes may be improving for some women, one in four women initiated prenatal care after the first trimester of pregnancy. About one in 10 women in Mississippi who had a baby in 2019 had high blood pressure and about one in 20 had diabetes. In 2019, Mississippi had the highest cesarean delivery rate in the nation, 38.5%, about four out of every 10 deliveries and 7.4% of our newborns had a neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit stay. Next slide. We haven't completed our analysis of maternal deaths for 2017 through 2019, but in the prior period, we found that about two out of three maternal deaths were among women who were black and between the ages of 20 and 29 years of age. More than two of three women who died had had a repeat cesarean section. Almost half of the women died within six weeks of delivery and another one in three died between six weeks and the first year following delivery. Almost one in three died in a hospital emergency department. Next slide. Mississippi leads the nation with the highest rates of preterm birth, 14.6 per 1,000 live births and low birth rate rates of 12.3 per 1,000 live births. More than 4,800 babies were born before 37 weeks gestation, and more than 4,100 were born weighing less than 2,500 grams. That's about five and a half pounds. Next slide. There were 322 infant deaths in 2019. The Mississippi infant mortality rate has changed little since 2012. And we have the highest rate in the nation, about nine deaths per 1,000 live births. The US rate is less than six per 1,000 births. The black infant, black-white infant mortality gap in Mississippi has changed little since 2012. 
the infant mortality rate in 2019 for black infants was almost 12 per 1,000 live births, and for white infants, 6.5 per 1,000 live births. Both of these rates were higher than the national rates of 10.8 for non-Hispanic black women and 4.6 for non-Hispanic black women or white women. The disparities by race are even more stark when we take into account whether the infant died within the neonatal period or the first 27 days of life or the post neonatal period between 28 and one, 28 days and one year of life. Black infants have a higher mortality rate in both periods, but especially during the neonatal period. This is depicted by the slide or the figure on the right. The red lines depict the mortality rates for black infants and the solid line is for the neonatal period. Next slide. Among the infants who died, two out of three were premature at birth, meaning they were born before 37 weeks of gestation and almost half weighed less than 1500 grams. That's about three pounds, four ounces. This is that low, very low birth weight category. And the three leading causes of death included prematurity, birth defects, and sudden unexpected infant death. In other causes, they were things like infections and accidental injury. That's all I have, Dr. Dobbs. I'm gonna turn it back over to Monica now. Very good, going thank you. to talk, go ahead. No, I was gonna say thank you, thank you, Laura. Okay, next slide. So good morning. I am going to talk um, a little bit about the strategies that we are implementing um, from a state level. Lauren has given us, um, provided us with some statistics and some data. And of course, you know, as we look at that data, it's always alarming to us. But we definitely want to make sure that everyone knows that what we're what we are what we are doing from a state level as far as strategies to prevent poor maternal and infant outcomes. Next slide. So some of you may have heard of the Mississippi Perinatal Quality Collaborative. It is a statewide collaborative that was formed in 2014. And so the goal of the collaborative is to promote evidence-based quality improvement initiatives at the hospital and community level. Um, this initiative um, um, really works with um, all birthing hospitals in the state of Mississippi. And we bring these hospitals together to work on um, data-driven projects that address specific drivers of maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality. The projects are selected by the participating members of the Quality Collaborative. And um, Mississippi Perinatal Quality Collaborative is also a part of the national network of perinatal quality collaboratives. And we work across the United States with other PQCs um, to look at the best practices, to learn, um, um, to talk about lessons that we've learned, and really just um, uh, want to stay up to date on the latest information in the quality improvement efforts. Um, the hospitals that participate in MSPQC also um, implement small PDSA studies, um, looking at the um, um, quality improvement within their hospitals. And so they are able to look at their own data to see how they are faring in their own hospital and what improvements that they need to make. And so that is all again facilitated through, um, you'll see MSPQC, that's our logo there. Um, and it is um, um, led by Dr. Charlene Collier. Next slide. But also I wanted to uh, make sure that everyone understood when if you hear us talk about AIM, um, it is a national organization. It's the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health. Um, it is a national data-driven maternal safety and quality improvement initiative um, based on interdisciplinary consensus-based practices to improve maternal safety outcomes. And so our uh, our projects that we um, that we are looking at, um, they are all uh, looking at what's called safety bundles, those maternal safety bundles, and they are, um, of course, evidence-based projects. And we work directly in collaboration with AIM. We are what's considered an AIM state, um, and so we work uh, very close in hand with the National AIM uh, program to implement these best practices. Next slide. So some of the AIM safety bundles that we are implementing in Mississippi, 
Um, the severe hypertension in pregnancy is one of the bundles. Um, the initiative to support vaginal births. And of course, you saw information about um, uh, vaginal births. And we, we are really trying to promote safe reduction of primary cesarean births, uh, making sure that they are medically necessary and that um, that women are safe during delivery. And then also we had, have an obstetric hemorrhage project that is in the maintenance phase. And for the sake of time, I know that I can't go into detail about every bundle, but there is a website uh, safe uh, that's at the bottom of this slide that you can go to, to see more details about the actual bundles, um, safehealthcareforeverywoman.org. And it really, outlines the bundles. They are very detailed in what the hospitals um, are working on and, and the actual steps that they take to implement these bundles. Um, so that's definitely something that if you are interested in learning more about, please take a look at that website. Next slide. And then also we wanted to um, show this slide to show some of the, the other AIM patient safety bundles um, that are out there. Um, typically our projects last 12 to 18 months um, because they can be so um, um, tedious to implement. But also you have to understand that within hospital systems, you have to have a team that works on the bundles. And so you have to have, you know, team champions, physician champions, nurse champions that all take a lead in implementing the bundle. So it is a very um, and I don't want to say time consuming, but you really have to have a team on board to really implement these bundles. So it takes a lot of engagement with the hospitals. Um, through MSPQC, we provide a lot of resources for the hospitals to ensure that they have what they need to implement um, the, the bundles um, and, and to implement the safety bundles. And so we provide trainings, we provide uh, resources, whether it's tear pads, whether it's uh, brochures, whether, whether it's anything that helps um, the, the team implement the bundles. And so you'll see the primary bundles, of course, you see obstetric hemorrhages there. Um, and the ones, the first three are the ones that we are currently implementing with, through MSPQC. Um, and then there are several others that uh, the supporting bundles, you see some that deal with maternal mental health, depression and anxiety, uh, postpartum care basics, um, support after a some severe maternal event, and then it, it's so many others. So again, I would advise you to take a look at the website to, so that you can see in detail um, about each bundle and what it entails. And so if you are a facility out there that's watching a hospital, a clinic, and you are interested in, be, I'm going to put a plug in, if you're interested in becoming a part of MSPQC, please let us know, um, because we are always uh, looking to work with our hospitals to help, um, um, help you uh, implement these bundles. Next slide. <laughs> I also wanted to mention a campaign um, that was developed by CDC. It's called Hear Her uh, Campaign. And this campaign is really um, to uh, really ensure that the woman is heard. It is, um, it, it, it wants to make sure that the urgent maternal warning signs are on the forefront of her mind so that if there is something wrong with her, if she feels that something is not right, um, that she can, that she makes sure that she tells her support system, whether it's her doctor, whether it's a family member, and then we urge uh, the woman to seek help immediately. So the campaign really, um, again, it's about listening to, uh, encouraging, empowering the woman to really listen to her body and really seek help immediately because some of the deaths that we see um, when we're reviewing the deaths here at uh, the health department, we see that uh, some of the complications come from delayed treatment. The woman uh, is feeling like she she's not being heard. Um, she's told somebody that things were happening to her and those concerns were uh, pushed off for delayed treatment. So this campaign, this is a camp, this is something that we really encourage our um, hospitals and those working in the community with mothers and families. We push this message out there. Um, and as you can see, there's an urgent maternal warning sign list on the side. There is a small, like, um, I guess like a postcard that you can give out to the mothers so that they'll know. So after they've delivered, you know, you can stick a magnet on the refrigerator so that they'll say, oh my God, you know, I'm having changes in my vision. I really need to, to get some seek help. 
Um, and so if someone who is pregnant or was pregnant within the last year and they have any of these symptoms, they should seek immediate uh, medical care. So this is, this is something that's really helpful um, when identifying those issues. Um, the uh, CDC also has uh, resources that can be printed off and given to uh, the patients. Next slide. <clears throat> Um, and also, I wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, some additional strategies to prevent poor maternal and infant outcomes. Um, I did want to mention that we, of course, facilitate the maternal mortality review um, here at the health department. This, that's one of our um, um, projects here. Um, the maternal mortality review has been in existence for uh, since 2017, but it is a group of um, experts that look at the deaths of women to look and really see what really happened clinically and then also socially that could have um, caused a death um, or pregnancy associated. Um, then also, of course, as I've talked about before, we implement the standardized patient safety bundles. Um, we promote the maternal early warning criteria protocols. And then also something that's very important that we have found is that we make sure that we involve emergency departments in obstetric emergencies um, because sometimes women go through the ER um, and we wanna make sure that the staff that are located in the emergency rooms are trained properly. So we provide stimulation trainings um, to um, hospitals and we invite um, you know, the emergency departments to be a part of that as well. And then also making sure the timely treatment of severe hypertension um, is noticed as well. And then from the infant side, um, looking at the reduction of SIDS and sleep-related deaths, we have um, initiatives in the health department, um, uh, Safe Sleep Projects, Education Campaign. Um, we had a Safe Sleep Mississippi or have a Safe Sleep Mississippi campaign that really pushes um, resources into the